Six members of one family have been found shot to death in their night clothes. There are countless videos on YouTube and elsewhere which cover the Amityville hauntings, but none provide you with the research and facts I present you with here. You'll even learn the identity of Jody the Demonic Pig. A crowd of neighbors gathered, mostly silent, with occasional muffled whispers as the coroner's van received the body bags, two adults and four children had been murdered. Suddenly, a collective gasp from everyone in attendance as the body of one young slain and blood-soaked child fell from a bag in public view. One of the murdered children fell out of a body bag. It was November 13, 1974. Police, news crews, and onlookers from around the neighborhood gathered in front of the house at 112 Ocean Avenue. Fear, confusion, and shock on their faces. This was the worst multi-fatality murder on Long Island since 1961. Michael Brigante, grandfather to slain children, father of Mr. Feo, was there. Refused entry by police, he argued, If this was New York, I'd have been inside already. He argued with the detective, I want to see my daughter before they put her in the bag. And to this day, nearly five decades later, many reasonable questions regarding those events still remain unanswered. But this video isn't about the murders. It's about what happened afterwards, when a year later, the Lutz family moved into the house. 28 days after that, January of 1976, they fled with just a change of clothes, vowing never to return. Or so the story goes. And two years after the Lutzes fled from the Amityville home, September 13, 1977, author Jay Anson released his book, The Amityville Horror, A True Story. The first film adaption was released in 1979, some say George and Kathy Lutz brought about the terror, the demons, the ghosts, by dabbling in the occult. Some say the house was built on an ancient Native American burial ground, and the vengeful spirits which possessed convicted murderer Ronald DeFeo Jr. also drove off the Lutzes. And some say it was all a hoax, that there was no truth to the tales of ghosts or demons whatsoever. But what motivation might anyone have to commit such a fraud? This video is an examination of what is arguably one of the most famous ghost stories in the United States. But what is true and what is fiction? Watch this video and your questions will be answered. And if you're new here and you enjoy this type of content, remember to subscribe. If you haven't watched my part one, the Amityville Murders video, there will be a link in the description. Though it isn't entirely necessary, it could be helpful in providing more context and detail. Was the house really haunted? The most obvious thing to consider is a simple observation. For any of the Lutz's story of demons, ghosts, and curses to be true, it would require demons, ghosts, and curses to be real. If those things aren't real, then that's it, right? End of story, right? This video will also discuss the conspiracies surrounding possible motivations for fraud, if in fact that is what happened. And of course, it also discussed the evidence in favor of the Lutz's story being true. After all, famed demonologist and paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren said it was all true, and I mean, they wouldn't lie, right? <laughs> I'll dive into the alleged hauntings in a minute, but first, just a few more details about the DeFeo murders. Ron Butch DeFeo Jr. was eventually charged as the lone gunman in killing his entire family. Three different lawyers were positioning themselves to defend Butch, two of whom were said to have been hired by Butch's grandfather, Michael Brigante. Miss DeFeo's father, who was known to have mob connections. It is fair to assume that at this time, Mr. Brigante believed in Butch's innocence. How could his grandson have murdered his own mother and his siblings? That was Mr. Brigante's daughter. Those were his grandchildren. This was his grandson. But that doubt must have changed as all three lawyers withdrew from the case within a short time. When none appeared in court to represent him, he was appointed William Weber. Weber refutes claims that his client killed his family for the insurance money, so prosecution alleges and begins to establish a defense of not guilty by plea of insanity. He introduces evidence that Butch had been rejected from military service for psychiatric reasons. During the trial, we learn that on November 8, 1974, just days before the murders, Ron Sr. yells at his eldest son, and Butch yells back, I'll kill you, you fat asshole. On November 13th, the day of the murders, Butch was seen with a bruised lip. It is believed the injury came from Ron Sr. striking his son in the face. During trial, it was revealed that Ron Sr. had been extremely physically abusive to his wife and particularly violent towards his eldest child, Butch. The trial concludes by convicting Ronald Butch DeFeo on six counts of second-degree murder. The insanity plea is rejected in part because of his actions after the murders, such as the manner in which he hid evidence. The jury believes that proved he knew exactly what he was doing. Time passes and the murders begin to fade from the news. 
On December 18, 1975, just 13 months after the DeFeo family murders, newlyweds George and Kathy Lutz, her three children from an earlier marriage, and the family dog, Harry, move into the large Dutch colonial house. The Lutzes received a great bargain for the home, purchasing it for approximately $80,000, a discount of around $60,000. George said they had looked at 40 to 50 other houses before finding the Amityville house. George is just 28 years old, turning 29 in December, while living in a house, and Kathy, she's 30. The three children are hers from a previous marriage. The Lutzes say they are unconcerned about the murders which had taken place there. And not only do they purchase the house for an extreme discount, for an extra $400, they managed to buy the DeFeo family's unclaimed furniture. But the house was haunted, and over the next 28 days, the Lutz family was tormented by unspeakable horrors. They tried to ignore these events since this had been such a huge financial investment. At the urging of a friend, on January 8, 1976, George and Kathy attempted to rid the house of the demonic spirits by walking room to room, holding a silver crucifix, while they both recited the Lord's Prayer. Entering the living room, George heard a chorus of voices call out, Will you stop? But they did not stop. Then on January 14, 1976, at 7 a.m., the Lutzes all crammed into their van and fled. The book was written from tapes made by George after they left. It depicts the hauntings as having occurred pretty evenly over the 28 days in which they lived there. During that time, the Lutz family was assailed by every imaginable paranormal phenomenon. According to the book and subsequent movie, the Lutzes had a priest bless the house. When the priest went into the room where the two young DeFeo boys had been murdered, an unseen force slapped him in the face and a voice told him to get out. One day, Kathy was cleaning and found a mysterious red room hidden behind a bookcase that was not on the original blueprints. She called George to inform him. The family dog refused to go near it and would cower instead, as if terrified of something inside. A terrible sewer smell would emanate from the room. The locks on the doors are found to drip a red substance. Is it blood? The walls drip slime. The Lutzes have to carry buckets of the substance to the river. George's personality changes and he becomes angry and abusive. It's as if the same demons that gripped Ron DeFeo now have their grip on George. George trips on a small statue and bite marks appear in his calf. On New Year's Eve, they see a demonic face in the fireplace with half its face blown away as if by a shotgun blast. On New Year's Day, they see red beady eyes looking at them from outside. They rush out to find only a line of tracks left in the snow by cloven hooves, as if from an enormous pig. The next morning, the footprints are still in the snow and the garage door is torn off its hinges. On January 3rd, George brings police detective Camarado back to the house where he sees the cloven tracks in the frozen snow and takes him to see the red room where he is said to have experienced a creepy feeling and strong vibrations. One evening, shortly after 3.15 a.m., George is checking on the boathouse. From outside, he looks up at Missy's window and sees her looking back at him. A demonic pig is glaring behind her with glowing red eyes. When George gets back in the house, he finds Missy asleep, but the rocking chair in her room is moving by an unseen force. The next morning, Missy tells them about her imaginary friend Jody, which only she can see. On one cold December night, Kathy noticed Missy's window was open and asked her why. Missy said it was open because Jody had to climb out. On January 11th or 12th, days before they flee the house, Missy calls George to her bedroom to meet Jody. George sees glowing red eyes just inside the window. Kathy walks in, sees what's happening, and throws a chair at the demonic creature, which smashes the window. One evening, George hears a marching band downstairs in the living room, and when he investigates, he discovers every piece of furniture has been moved and the rug has been rolled back. They threw out a ceramic lion that Kathy had given George, and the next day it reappeared back in the house. The kids said they didn't bring it back in. They say it would move around when they weren't watching it, sometimes only a short distance, other times they would find it in a different room. The large wooden doors of the house were torn off by demonic forces. George was always cold and kept building fires, saying cold spots would manifest in the house, in the hallways, in the rooms. Kathy levitated off the bed. Her face aged decades before George's eyes, and she had nightmares of the murders and the order they occurred. She is forced to see the DeFeo children being shot. She is even embraced by a spirit which she believes to be Miss DeFeo. Welts appeared on her body. 
Describing events from their last night in 1980, George said, It was an accumulation of events all at the same time which caused us to leave. Beds were banging up and down on the floor, furniture was sliding around, and drawers were flying back and forth. Doors throughout the home were opening and slamming shut. Those aren't even all of the events the Lutz family said happened, and they claimed the dark spirits followed them even after they left. Now that is a summary of events they claim to have experienced. George and Kathy Lutz maintained their entire life, even after divorcing, that the story was true. Some sources claim Kathy recanted after they divorced in the late 1980s, but such allegations are false. Neither of them ever wavered in their insistence that the hauntings were true. In June of 1979, George and Kathy Lutz took polygraph tests performed by experts in the field. The results did not indicate lying. Daniel and Christopher Lutz, George's stepchildren, who make no secret of their hatred for George, were ages seven and nine at the time, and both maintain to this day the house was haunted, though they admit George exaggerated many of the events. It should also be noted that Missy Lutz, who allegedly had the imaginary demon pig friend Jody, has never spoken publicly about it. Daniel Lutz claimed as recently as 2013 that something evil passed through him, that an evil entity followed him as a child. Famed paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren, popularized in The Conjuring movies, both emphatically said the house was haunted. Lorraine insisted it was the closest to hell that she had ever been. The Warrens investigated the Amityville house in March of 1976 with a news crew and a photographer who set up an automatic camera taking infrared photographs. That camera captured an image of what might be the best concrete evidence in support of the stories, the demonic ghost boy. A man appeared in the 1970s television show In Search Of, claiming to be the priest from the book who was slapped and told to get out by an unseen entity. All of the windows in the house operated on a weights and pulley system. And since the house is old, they don't always work correctly. This can cause a window to open or close by itself. There's nothing paranormal about that, but it would offer an explanation in support of their experiences. The cold spots in the house? It was December. The heating was broken. They didn't have any money to fix the heater. Just like the mundane explanation for the windows, there's nothing supernatural about it. And now for evidence against their claims. The Red Room. The book says the Red Room was used for sacrificing cats and dogs and blood rituals. The Red Room was supposedly used by John Ketchum, a witch and original owner of the house who sacrificed Native Americans in the room. This seems unlikely, though, since the room is actually just a two foot four inch wide by three foot six inch long by three foot six inch high storage space used by the DeFeo children to store their toys. It was painted red only because that was the color of paint they had at the time. A neighbor who played with the DeFeo children confirmed this. The claims of the room oozing blood, that was just red paint that chipped off the walls. In an interview promoting his 2005 remake of the Amityville Horror, actor Ryan Reynolds claimed the house was one of the first Dutch colonials in New York, claiming it was built in the late 17th century, 1692 or something, and that the Red Room had been used by Jack Ketchum to torture and kill Indians. Now, I love Ryan, and it pains me to say this, but none of those allegations have any truth behind them. I don't believe he was intentionally lying to promote his film. I'm guessing he was just misinformed, and maybe he read the book and believed the whole true story shtick. I mean, maybe the book just exaggerated a little bit about the Red Room. I mean, maybe they found little two-foot-tall Native Americans to sacrifice in there. Who knows? From the time the Lutzes moved out until the first publication of the book, nearly two years had passed. During that time, Newsday magazine had published several interviews with George Lutz. Several elements from those interviews did appear, though drastically altered, to seem more pronounced and severe. And many of the elements in the book were not mentioned at all or specifically contradicted by George's earlier interviews. Many of the fabrications seemed to have originated from published articles in Newsday magazine authored by Paul Hoffman. And as Stephen Kaplan documents so well in his book, The Amityville Horror Conspiracy, Hoffman's stories changed repeatedly, growing more bizarre with each retelling. Newsday magazine was founded in 1940 and advertises itself as the leading news source for Long Island and New York City. The prologue of the first published hardcover says reporter Steve Bauman investigated the house and discovered something terrible had happened to every family that had ever lived there. Not only was this a fabrication, it's a fabrication that was originally attributed to an Amityville sheriff in a Newsday magazine article 
prior to the book's publication. The changes made to alleged events in the house from the first published Prentice Hall hardcover to the 14th edition are so great, it would require a separate video just to cover them all. And frankly, who cares? But how did the truth change if it really was the truth? Or were these changes made to protect them from future lawsuits? Remember the polygraph test they passed? Well, lie detector tests are nearly meaningless. Remember Scott Peterson, who murdered his wife, Lacey Peterson, with their unborn child? He passed the lie detector test. Lie detector tests, even in 2022, are not admissible in court as proof of anything. Rick Morin of the Psychical Research Foundation stated at the time that 83 of the 103 reports of paranormal phenomenon reported in the house were proven as false, and the book was a complete miscarriage of justice, which made those involved in paranormal investigation look like raving lunatics. Everyone familiar with this story has heard about Father Pecoraro, who comes to the house to bless it. And while sprinkling holy water, he hears a voice telling him to get out. But in the original Newsday articles, it is George who is blessing the house, and it is George telling the spirits to get out. During the course of a lawsuit surrounding the case in the late 1970s, Father Pecoraro stated in an affidavit that his only contact with the Lutz family concerning this matter had been by telephone. Likewise, the Catholic Diocese stated that none of the events claimed in the book involving the priest ever happened. The Amityville police also denied any involvement claimed in the book, and the detective named in the book was furious, stating he had only met George two times, and that was only briefly at the police station. The only interactions with George occurred when he visited the police station to turn in his handgun, claiming that he was experiencing desire to shoot his wife. He then returned the next day to retrieve it. The book claims George boarded up doors in the house to stop evil spirits. Not only were there no signs of such damage to the doors, but the doors in question opened the opposite direction, making those claims just ridiculous. Future inhabitants have never experienced any of the alleged cold spots. The stories about cloven tracks in the snow is a verifiable fact. There was no snow on the ground anywhere near Amityville on or near the dates claimed. As for damage to the building, Photographic evidence proved those claims were false. The next family to own the home verified there was no damage to any door or window. The Lutzes didn't have money to fix their broken heater, so it's a reasonable assumption they didn't fix any damaged doors or windows, and nor did they ever claim to. Subsequent homeowners stated that all such fixtures were the original items and had not been repaired or replaced. George's claims of furniture having moved are contradicted by interviews he gave prior to the publication of the book. In one interview, he specifically said there were never any instances of furniture moving. There's the tale of how Daniel Lutz had his hand smashed in a window. In the version written by Paul Hoffman for Newsday, he is closing a window in the sewing room after George's exorcism ritual, the same room where the priest allegedly encountered the face slap and demonic voice, warning him to get out. But in the book, he's closing his parents' bedroom window because of a rainstorm. In Hoffman's version, it is an aluminum storm window. In Jay Anson's version, it is a heavy wooden window frame. In Hoffman's original account, Daniel suffered minor cuts. In Jay Anson's version, the boy's fingers were flattened. The tale alleges Daniel was taken to the hospital for his wounds, but the hospital never had any record of Daniel ever being there. I also know there's nothing supernatural about those old double-framed windows slamming down your fingers. I actually have a scar on my pinky knuckle uh, from one of those things like slamming down when I was like six years old. In the same house, my mother had all of her fingernails come off from having her hand crushed in one. It wasn't a ghost, though. Those old double frames are just safety hazards. The claim that the house was built on a site where the Shinnecock Indians had once abandoned their mentally ill and dying was rejected by local Native American leaders. The Shinnecock Indians never even inhabited that area. The entire story was fabricated by a so-called spirit medium. George says he woke up at 3.15 a.m., and that was significant because it was the time of the DeFeo murders. Everyone repeats the 3.15 a.m. thing as the time of the murders, but it isn't based on any conclusions made by the coroners. The coroner simply stated that the deaths occurred at some point in the early mornings. And as I covered in my previous video, the body farm wasn't established until the 1980s. The 3.15 a.m. number comes from a neighbor who said they heard Shaggy the DeFeo's dog barking. That's all it is. And the famous ghost boy photo. You know, that, that had me fooled for years. I still can't tell you exactly what it is or 
isn't, but, but when I realized that the photo hadn't even been shown to the public until three years after it was allegedly taken, and given the overwhelming amount of fraud already in this case, there's plenty of time there for it to have been altered or outright fabricated. Paul Hoffman's Newsday article said red blood-like ooze dripped from the keyholes. But in Jay Anston's book, it was green slime like jello which oozed from the walls and had to be slopped up in buckets and dumped in the river. But Kathy Lutz gave an interview in the National Enquirer after they moved, and in her version, it was black ooze which hardened. In that same National Enquirer interview, Kathy claimed she also heard the ghostly marching band. Some sources really reaching for an explanation here have suggested the ooze may have been the fingerprint ink from after the murders mixed with water used to wash the walls. That seems like such a huge stretch when, hey, they just made all this crap up is much more likely. The various owners of the house since the Lutz family left in 1976 have reported no problems with living there. The family which bought the house immediately after the Lutzes changed the house number and sued the author, the publisher, and the Lutzes for $1.1 million. And they sought to have a true story removed from the book description. Now, if I had to guess, I'd say this might be why the movie never claimed to be a true story. The lawsuit for $1.1 million was later thrown out by the judge for failure to prove any claim of liability. Shortly after the Lutzes fled, a friend of theirs said they had abandoned the property because the heating had failed and they were out of money for repairs. George claimed he saw Jody the Demon Pig on December 25th on the night of full moon. However, it is a verifiable fact there was only a quarter moon that evening. And the identity of Missy's demonic pig? Well, that was determined to be the neighbor's Siamese cat, Evan Rood, who used to climb up on the porch and peer into the windows. His eyes would reflect red. This is the fact confirmed by the neighbor who owned the cat, as well as the family who bought the home after the Lutzes. Additionally, from an interview with a debunker on the Art Bell Show, I learned that Ron DeFeo Jr. is the one who hated the cat, and he's the one that nicknamed it the Demonic Pig, or the Demon Cat. The stories claim George was always angry and yelling at the children, but stress can do that to a person. He used to be a Marine, and maybe he suffered from some PTSD. Maybe the huge financial debt that he couldn't pay was sinking in. Whatever the cause, demonic possession really seems like the least likely reason. And in February of 1976, before any paranormal investigations had been conducted, George had already signed a book contract for the story of the alleged hauntings. And then finally, in a September 17, 1979 issue of People magazine, William Weber wrote, I know the book is a hoax. We created this horror story over many bottles of wine. So let me just tell you, when I'm looking at something like this, I want it to be true. I do, I want it to be true. But the conclusions with this, well, let me just share them with you now. When the Lutz family fled their Amityville home, they were in deep financial debt. To make matters worse, the IRS was auditing George's construction business and breathing down his neck. I heard versions which claimed they each had owned a house from their prior marriages, which they sold to buy the Amityville house. In an interview, William Weber said the Lutzes didn't have the 80K and only put 40K down and owed the rest. To top it off, the house needed repairs, which they couldn't afford. There are rumors that the Lutzes knew Ronald DeFeo Jr.'s defense lawyer, William Weber, prior to moving into the house, but there's no evidence to support those claims. From one prison interview, Ronald DeFeo Jr. claimed he knew Kathy Lutz and used to help her obtain cocaine. Again, there's no evidence to support those claims. It is a verifiable, proven fact that George Lutz had books on the occult. When he purchased these, it isn't known. But if you spent any time at all listening to people try to explain what happened in that house, you're going to hear, George caused it all because he was dabbling in the occult. First off, using that explanation means you're taking a position that events in the house, or at least some of those events, took place. And I, I kind of feel like we just covered that. There's no verifiable evidence or reliable witnesses which prove any of it actually occurred. Furthermore, in most instances, the knowable material facts directly contradict Lutz's allegations. Secondly, and this is a really big point to consider, if dabbling in the occult could cause huge wooden doors to fly off hinges, windows to open and close through some magical force, disembodied marching bands to manifest in your living room, furniture to levitate, 
Wives to rapidly age 80 years, blood to ooze through keyholes, green slime and black slime to pour from walls, and demonic pigs to leave prints in non-existent snow. Our world would be a whole lot weirder than it already is. Every occult shop in the country would be churning out sorcerers threatening the very fabric of reality. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness wouldn't be some superhero fantasy, it would be a terrifying documentary. We'd all be enslaved to diabolical wizards. There'd be tornadoes ripping through the Midwest composed of demons summoned and controlled by goth kids who play Dungeons and Dragons. Another allegation is that George and Kathy had gone to some classes to learn about transcendental meditation. This is supported by George and their friends. But if you or anyone you know is able to meditate OM and open the gates of hell, be sure to get a recording of it and contact me. Some have argued that it had to be true because the Lutzes had no way of knowing their story would become such a huge sensation. And I agree. They couldn't have known how big their story would become, but but that doesn't mean it's true either. And those are the facts of this case as time will allow. I don't generally share my personal opinion in these videos, but this time I'm making an exception. If you don't wish to hear that, you should probably turn the video off now. So my conclusion is this. When searching for an answer in the Amityville case, I believe it is appropriate to remember that the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. All of the knowable facts and evidence point to a young newlywed couple who saw an amazing house at a huge discount, and they thought they could make it work. How many times have you found yourself maybe overspending on something and regretting it later? Buying the house was just a mistake, not a conspiracy. But they soon realized they could neither afford it financially nor emotionally, unable to shake the tragedy which had occurred there. Looking for a way out and looking to recoup their financial losses, a tale of hauntings was born. There is no evidence they ever knew the murderer, Ronald DeFeo Jr., or his attorney, William Weber, prior to purchasing the home. But it does seem William Weber was an early participant in the creation of their ghost story as part of a strategy to obtain a new trial for his client. As for Daniel and Christopher Lutz, the most logical answer, if we're being generous, is they may have experienced bouts of stress-induced sleep paralysis hallucinations. They were young children who hated their abusive stepfather in addition to being moved around, changing schools, and so on. Those are all perfect ingredients for episodes of stress-induced sleep paralysis. If they experienced anything weird, I would have to believe that this is the explanation. And memory of such events can be sketchy, especially if you aren't educated in such phenomenon. And that's all it is. It just got way out of hand. They stuck to their story because the humiliation of admitting their mistakes and deception would have been worse than facing the truth. If we're just speculating here, that may have even been what eventually led to their divorce. But if none of those explanations work for you and you insist the Lutz family experienced something in that house, there's really only one remaining possibility. That's if Ronald DeFeo Jr. soaked all the doorknobs in LSD prior to being arrested and for some reason the Lutz family had a doorknob licking fetish. Well, that, that would explain everything they experienced. And it's certainly more plausible than anything written in Jay Anson's Amityville Horror. If you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, give us a comment, tell me what you think. My name is Atten, I'm your host, and this is Haunted History Seattle. Thanks for watching.